For the past five years, no production car could stop quicker than a Porsche 911 GT2 RS, at least not in Motor Trend's extensive testing. Porsche reigned king for a long stint, but that no longer remains true. Hello everyone and welcome, in this video we're covering the impressive feat achieved by the Ford Mustang Dark Horse, the shortest stopping distance of any road legal production car in the history of Motor Trends testing. That record? Just 86 feet from traveling at 60 miles per hour to a full stop. All right, so 86 feet to stop from 60 to zero miles per hour. That's kind of a random jumble of numbers. Who really cares? So let's give it a bit of context. And so if we're to calculate acceleration using these numbers here, in order to decelerate from 60 down to zero in just 86 feet, well, you do a little bit of math and you find out that that means your average deceleration is 1.4 G's, which is extremely impressive. In all of Motor Trends testing, this is the only car that's ever done it. Now, a little context on how this testing works, as it is important in understanding where this 1.4 G's comes from. So the test itself, you're going to start the vehicle above 60 miles per hour. You're going to slam on the brake pedal, and then you're going to let ABS do all the work, right? So as you slam on that brake pedal above 60 miles per hour, it's going to go up and reach somewhere around that peak G-force that it's it's able to decelerate at. Then the second you cross over 60 miles per hour, the clock starts. So we've already reached our peak deceleration force here, and then we just maintain that all the way to a stop, and then of course our acceleration goes to zero. So the average for that 60 to zero is that 1.4 Gs, and because we know that we've already reached the peak before we stop uh, for the entirety of that 60 to zero deceleration run, well that can give us a good guess estimate of what the tire's frictional coefficient is. In other words, how much grip does that tire have? And so that frictional coefficient just correlating with the g-forces, so a mu of 1.4. Now, in a previous video, I explained how you can use this frictional coefficient to predict the theoretical best zero to 60 time possible for a production car to achieve. Because now, today, we're at the limit of our tires. We're no longer limited by horsepower as far as what zero to 60 times we can get. So using this frictional coefficient of 1.4, well, we can use our equation, velocity equals acceleration times time. We have 88 feet per second, which is equivalent to 60 miles per hour. Divide that by 45 feet per second second squared, which is 1.4 Gs, just in, you know, dumb American units. And so you do that math, you divide, and you get a time of 1.95 seconds. So using today's tires, yes, it is possible to break the two second barrier. Now I am talking about a true zero to 60. So it is common within the industry to delete the first foot. This is called rollout. I don't agree with it, but it is the norm. And with rollout, you would be deleting about 0.15 to about 0.3 seconds, so this would give us a theoretical predicted 0 to 60 time of about 1.65 to about 1.80 if you were deleting that first foot of rollout. So, you know, real 0 to 60 time is this 1.95, uh, but if you look at the, you know, current claims for records out there, Dodge Demon saying they are doing it in 1.66 seconds with rollout, so that does fall within this range, as well as the Remac Nevera, which they claim a 0 to 60 of 1.74 seconds, again, using rollout, so leading that first foot of acceleration. So it is, you know, kind of wild uh, where we're at today and that we can break that two second barrier. Though to be honest, I don't know if there is a third party verification of a vehicle actually breaking two seconds uh, and not showing a time that uses rollout in order to do it. So it would be cool to see the first third party to do this. And again, it needs to be a production car, you know, one pulled from a customer or something like that, not something that's been wildly prepped from the factory and is the first off the line and some crazy prototype. All right, so getting back to the Mustang Dark Horse, when they set this record, part of me thinks, you know, is this lame or is it actually cool? And I do think that it's cool, but there is a really lame implication that comes along with this record. So I asked Motor Trend if they could send me the top 20 shortest braking distances they have in all of their testing. And thank you to Motor Trend, they did send that data over. And so an interesting thing happens when you plot out these 20 vehicles with their weight versus 
versus their braking distance in feet. And so you'll notice basically what happens is it just forms a straight line because once you get the best tires on your car and you achieve this maximum friction uh, and you have ideal conditions, well, they're all gonna have a relatively similar braking distance. The thing that's upsetting here is, if you look at the Mustang uh, here all the way on the end, it is the heaviest of the top 20 by far. On average, it is about 500 pounds heavier than all the other cars uh, in this top 20 for shortest braking distance. So, you know, what does that mean? Well, it means that tires can hide the weight of a car, and that's exactly what they've done here. So yes, you know, there are reasons why you want to keep a vehicle lightweight. It's going to improve handling. It's going to improve acceleration. Uh, it's gonna reduce, you know, how much energy you have going into your brakes by pulling weight out. But in this case, the heaviest vehicle of the top 20, uh, shortest braking distances, also happens to have the shortest braking distance. And I just feel like that is this thing that allows manufacturers to go, well, hey, it's still super safe. Like it breaks really quick. Uh, and so it allows them to think, you know, hey, it's all right to be lazy and have, you know, our sports cars weighing over 4,000 pounds, which just, in my opinion, is wrong. On the flip side, this just shows how absolutely powerful tires are. I mean, there's a reason why I think they're one of the absolute coolest things about cars. Now, to illustrate how cool tires are, I pulled some data from a car and driver top 15 list where they were looking at their shortest 70 to zero mile per hour stopping distances in their own testing. And so what's wild is you can have a fairly similar plot here, except instead of weight versus braking distance, we're looking at price versus braking distance. And again, you just have that flat line. So, you know, a Ferrari La Ferrari, well over a million dollars, and it's stopping just like everything else that's well under a quarter million dollars. So, what's awesome about this is just that tires are the limiting factor. Physics doesn't care how much money you have. You can't just throw money at the problem and expect to win. So, you can have, you know, the most expensive braking system out there, the most advanced suspension in the world, lightweight, insane materials, a uh, crazy, well tuned ABS system. Them. And yet none of it really matters, right? A Mustang under $100,000 can do it all because it has really good tires. It's just so cool that tires are this unifying factor that's just like, hey, we're all gonna be about the same because this is what matters the most. And so, you know, you can go to a track and you can throw some racing tires on your car and assuming it's got the braking system to handle it, you can beat literally every production car on street legal road tires. Like that's wild that that can be done. So I want to get back to this point. Can you throw money at it and actually have better braking distance? Well, maybe so. Cut to the McMurtry Spearling. So the specifications I have for this car are for the prototype, they're not for the production version. And this is a track only vehicle. So we're not talking about breaking, you know, road going vehicle production records here, but it does illustrate how you can use something other than tires in order to improve grip and thus improve stopping distances. So looking at the specifications for the prototype, we have a vehicle that weighs about 2,200 pounds. And because it has two fans, that are constantly pulling air from underneath and shooting it out the back. It's not the shooting out the back part that is important, it's creating a vacuum underneath the car that is important, that is sucking it down to the ground. It's able to produce about 4,400 pounds of downforce, so it's going to generate absurd grip. Just to give you an idea, this vehicle is rear wheel drive, and yet it's capable of achieving a zero to 60 in just 1.4 seconds. Again, we're talking about the prototype here, and again, this is not a production car, but that is faster than any production car, and it's only using the rear wheels to accelerate. This is possible because of that massive downforce. Otherwise, it would be much closer to our theoretical limit using street tires of somewhere around 1.95 seconds. All right, so to demonstrate just how powerful this downforce is, and again, one of the things that's really cool about this is that it's able to do it at zero miles per hour, right? It's not reliant on aero, it's reliant on the fans, and the fans can work at any speed you're driving, right? So you can have this downforce at any speed you're driving. So it can be very useful for braking. Just how powerful? Well, let's go with our prototype weight of 2,200 pounds and say it's making 4,400 pounds of downforce. And let's say we have a 170 pound driver and let's say our tires frictional coefficient is 1.4 using similar tires to the Mustang. Well, with all of that, we would be able to decelerate at a rate of four Gs. It's so exciting that the marker literally can't even ride it. 
And so if we look at our 60 to zero time for an average car today, it's about 120 feet stopping at about one G. Well, this is four times that, meaning it could stop from 60 miles per hour to zero in yes, just 30 feet. That is absolutely absurd. Imagine driving down the highway, you're traveling at 60 miles per hour, you slam on the brakes, and in less than two car lengths, you're stopped. Now, these are just estimates and they are my own calculations, but I have no doubt that there is no production car today that can stop as quick as this vehicle can. Now, speaking of vehicles that have absurd amounts of grip, top fuel drag racers. So these cars have a prepared surface, they've got insanely sticky track tires, and they've got over 10,000 horsepower. What's not to love? And recently, a top fuel car hit the eighth mile at 300 miles per hour. First time it's ever happened, 300.8 miles per hour in 2.963 seconds. That's an average acceleration up to 300 miles per hour of 4.6 Gs, over 4.6 Gs. And that means every 60 mile per hour increment uh, from zero all the way to 300 is happening in less than 0.6 seconds. These are numbers that just boggle the mind. It's absolutely crazy how quick accelerating top fuel vehicles are. So there are ways you can buy your way out of, you know, this problem of accelerating or stopping quicker. The thing is, you know, we're talking about track friendly versions, not street friendly versions where the tire actually has to last a certain number of miles. Now I have one final point to make and that is even under ideal conditions, braking can be very messy and I did not expect to see this. So I was looking at a test conducted by Car and Driver where they were testing the braking distances for the Porsche GT4 RS. Well, this vehicle is among the very best they have ever tested and so it's kind of cool to look at the data behind it and see what happens. And so if you look at a plot of speed versus time, Car and Driver does conduct their testing slightly differently from Motor Trend. You're starting just above 70 and you're including that time of pressing the pedal and seeing how the car reacts. And so you have a slight time where you're staying, you know, somewhere around 70 miles per hour. And then you have a fairly constant line down to the final stopping time. And in this case, the vehicle was able to stop in 2.5 seconds from 70 miles per hour. Now, what is interesting about this, you shouldn't use it for predicting grip because again, you have that initial ramp up and deceleration where you're pressing on that brake pedal and you don't yet have peak friction. And so the motor trend test better for predicting what is the tire's actual grip, the car and driver test better for predicting what is the true, in this case, 70 to zero because it includes the time of you pressing that pedal. So when you look at time versus deceleration, What's very interesting, and I didn't expect to see based on, you know, there's basically a straight line for speed just going down, is that the deceleration rate is changing constantly. And so, of course, you're going to have this initial peak. You might wonder, how does it spike, you know, above 1.7 Gs on that initial tip in? Well, the faster you're traveling, you've got air resistance pushing you back, and if the car has downforce, which the GT4 RS is capable of, well, that means you have better braking. So that initial peak doesn't shock me that, you know, it's over something like 1.4 Gs. Of course it is. You've got wind resistance and you've got downforce, both of which are helping you to slow down very quickly initially. But as you get to those lower speeds, you can't rely on downforce or wind resistance to slow you down. And so that's why it was surprising to me to see in the data these huge, you know, peaks and valleys going through where it's bouncing between, you know, below 0.9 Gs to above 1.4 Gs. I mean, over a 0.5 G gap. And again, if you look at the trace, like it's fairly constant. It just goes, you know, there it is. But if you look deep into the data at a really fine scale, you see that G force peaking all over the place on that surface. So. There's a lot of variables that can cause this. What's your surface like? What's your loading like? How's the ABS working out? How are the brakes working out? What's your sampling rate? There's a lot of reasons why it can look like this, but it's very interesting that it does, and it's not you know, a more linear, more constant, just deceleration rate. You get the average at the end, it does really good in the end, uh, but the data is actually quite messy in how it achieves that. 
Okay, so how did the Mustang Dark Horse do in car and driver's testing? All right, quiet bombshell, it wasn't even top 15. And honestly, it's not even that close to the field. The 2019 Corvette ZR1 outbraked the Mustang by 15 feet in car and driver's 70 to zero mile per hour testing. I think this illustrates a few points, the differentiation in testing methodology, and importantly, the testing conditions can play a huge role. So maybe the Mustang isn't the best braking vehicle. I don't know why it brings me joy to make an entire video feel pointless right at the end of it, but it is cool what the Dark Horse achieved. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.